Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our new campus conversation series. Please come in. Uh, if you're here, we're delighted to see you and um, find a seat, and we'll get more chairs if we need them. Um, so this is a, a, a new series we've begun called What's Going On and Why, and Can We Imagine a More Just Future? Uh, the goal of this year-long series is to have the faculty, students, and staff engage with each other about some of the big issues of our time that are going on now and affecting all of us. Um, after the wrenching incidents of this summer of unprovoked and senseless violence involving innocent people, both civilians and police, it seemed imperative to me that we as a community dedicated to social justice and diversity come together to try to understand these events and talk about these issues. And once we opened the door to this kind of community conversation, it then became clear that there are many issues out there that we can bring forth for further understanding and discussion. And as a linear thinker uh, who puts a premium on rationality as well as the significance of culture and diversity, which of course are not mutually exclusive in any way, um, it made sense to me to begin each topic with some background, some context, so that we can begin to understand at least some of the causes of what we see going on around us. Uh, there are lots of seats up here. Uh, so no backbenchers. The backbenchers are all seated. Um, the second and equally critical part of this campus conversation is the conversation, the sharing of ideas to see if we can indeed imagine a more just future and begin to figure out how to work toward it. So I encourage all of you to attend the open forum part of this month's conversation next week, September 14th at, um, I'm sorry, September 21st, uh, also at noon uh, here in Student Center East. And I also encourage you to continue these conversations um, in the classroom, with your friends, with your colleagues, uh, and with your families. I want to give a special thanks first uh, on, on one account to Professor Barbara Ransby for helping to formulate the concept of the campus conversation, along with Professors Amanda Lewis, Teresa Cardova, Tyrone Foreman, Jane Rhodes, Amalia Polaris, and Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Rex Tolliver. So we begin today with the summer of 2016. Next month, uh, we'll have a similar uh, panel or lecture uh, towards the beginning of the month about the election of 2016. Lots to talk about there. And in November, the topic will be the world around us, immigration, migration, and displacement. And again, the first part of the month, there will be a panel discussion or a lecture to provide some context. And then a week or two later, there will be more of an open forum uh, with more opportunity for discussion, although I imagine we're going to have some question and answer here as well. So now please join me in thanking and welcoming today's moderator and panelists, Barbara Ransby, Teresa Cardova, Beth Ritchie, Juliana Stratton, and Amy Watson for sharing their time and their expertise with us. We're debating whether to stay seated or. Uh, okay, so I've just gotten the word that we're going up. Or some, I am, yeah, she's going up, I'm going up. I'm being democratic here. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. We apologize about the signage snafu, but you found your way here, so um, we're very glad to be able to have this conversation. I want to start by um, commending our provost for her foresight and leadership uh, in launching this important conversation series. Uh, there's a lot of ways we could approach um, some of the issues that we'll be talking about today as an institution. One would be to retreat, right? One would be to look the other way. One would be to say it's someone else's uh, problem. And the other would be to, to, to deal with it in a very uh, isolated way in our own personal um, context, in our own personal um, individual departments and so forth. So to make this a campus discussion and to take on um, some of the, the vexing and complicated questions uh, of our city and our society, you know, I think is, is, is exemplary and I'm just um, happy to be a part of it. I'm not going to speak for a long time as a moderator because we have a very short uh, amount of time. Uh, today we're talking about violence, policing, and race, uh, and these intersecting issues. These issues um, have become very, very poignant in the city of Chicago, but they are not new to Chicago, nor are they 
isolated or unique to Chicago. Um, a new generation of activists have forced many of these issues into the forefront uh, of national consciousness. Some of those activists um, are our students. Uh, but since um, August of 2014, really, you know, the names of Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and Eric Garner and Sandra Bland and many others have been forced into um, our vocabulary and really revealing some longstanding um, issues that are very profound and painful to, to many of us. Now, we know in one hour we cannot do justice to the range of of issues that we've laid out here. Um, that's why there's another conversation, which Provost already um, uh, announced to you, and that will be next week, uh, September 21st, in the same uh, building. So we invite you to come back for that. Uh, but I cannot imagine uh, four more uh, capable people, more um, engaged um, or, or really brilliant colleagues and the four people on this panel to launch this conversation, to give us some frame, some parameters, uh, and some context for wrestling with uh, a very difficult uh, set of issues. I'm going to introduce them uh, briefly. They're each going to take uh, about seven to ten minutes to, um, to lay out some ideas for you to, to think about and, and hopefully to come back next week uh, and talk about. And we've really divided the panel into two parts. Uh, the first part is, is defining the problem. And Beth Ritchie, as many of you know, is um, an internationally renowned um, expert on violence against women in particular, but has been very much um, a part of both the intellectual community and a political community um, that has taken on uh, combating uh, violence and helping us to understand it. So she's going to lay out uh, the larger framework. Uh, Beth Ritchie is a professor in African American Studies, Criminology, Sociology, uh, and Gender and Women's Studies, uh, and former director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy. Uh, she is the author of um, two very well-known and widely read books, um, Arrested Justice, Black Women Violence, and America's Prison Nation, uh, and Compelled to Crime, the Gender Entrapment of Black Battered uh, Women. Uh, she's a recipient of numerous honors, recognitions, uh, and awards, and she will be a part of that first part of the conversation and our first speaker. Um, following Beth Ritchie is Teresa Cordoba. Uh, Teresa is the director of UIC's Great Cities Initiative. She's also a professor in CUPA, the College of Urban Planning uh, and Policy. Uh, I always get that wrong, Sally. College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, CUPA, with the dean, sitting, the, the dean of that college sitting right in front of me, frowning. <laughs> um, as an applied theorist, political uh, economist, and community-based planner, Professor Cordoba approaches her work as a scholarship of engagement uh, in which pedagogy and service are integral. Her analysis of global and local dynamics, including the impacts of globalization on Latino uh, communities, informs her publications. Um, she is also uh, uh, one of the people who oversaw uh, the recent study, which, which really talked about the economic basis for some of the problems we see in our communities um, in Chicago. And that study was called Lost, the Crisis of Jobless, Jobless and Out-of-School Teens and Young Adults uh, in Chicago and the U.S. And so she'll talk about some of the economic uh, parameters and she'll be our se second speaker. And then we'll shift uh, to a discussion of solutions, and, and I don't mean solutions writ large, I mean how can we begin to approach some of the issues around race, uh, policing, and violence differently. Uh, and then we will have uh, some remarks by Amy Watson. Uh, Amy is a professor at the Jane Addams College of Social Work here at UIC. Uh, many of you may have heard her on the radio and in various print media uh, talking about uh, her research, which is um, around crisis intervention teams and that approach uh, to policing, particularly when it relates to uh, persons with mental illness. She is the uh, PI of a $3.1 million five-year grant from the National Institute of Mental Health uh, to study this approach and its effectiveness, and we're really um, honored to have her with us. Uh, and finally, um, Professor Juliana Stratton. Uh, Juliana Stratton is a former executive director of Cook County Justice for Children, independent nonprofit that promotes transparency and accountability uh, by the Cook County Juvenile Court and is head of the UIC Center for Public Safety and Justice, uh, again in CUPA. Uh, previously, uh, Professor Stratton was Executive Director of Cook County Justice Advisory Council and managed the criminal and juvenile reform agenda uh, for Cook County Board uh, Pres President uh, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, uh, including leading community engagement strategies to reduce uh, youth violence. And she has been very instrumental um, in um, 
uh, restorative justice, and she'll talk to us about that uh, concept of restorative justice as an alternative approach uh, to violence, both community violence and street violence. So please um, join me in welcoming the panel, and we'll start off with Dr. Beth Ritchie. Thank you. So good afternoon, UIC. Thank you. Um, well, let's see. With the grim statistics that have been reported recently in uh, several local and national media outlets, over 3,000 people shot in Chicago already this year. Um, Chicago is the city with the highest number of police shootings of any American city. Not surprising to many of you. At least 14 of those cases since 2010, police shot unarmed citizens who thought they had a gun. Very troubling, of course, around those uh, shootings are the court rulings that so clearly declare that police are um, granted uh, impunity for their excessive use of force, it's so-called, or discharging a firearm uh, if the conditions are right for them to do so. And perhaps to me most importantly are the stories behind those statistics that we're reading about. The families, the children, the communities that are so disproportionately represented in, those, uh, in that violence. Most of those are black families. Uh, families living in neighborhoods where they're terrified, where they're physically hurt, some long-term injury, they're in many ways immobilized by the chaos around us, and living in this combined moment of fear and rage, living and dying in Chicago's most disadvantaged neighborhoods. With all of that, I was somewhat relieved this morning after looking at the paper, that at least our campus was opening up the opportunity to have this conversation. I hope it's a serious one. I hope it's an ongoing one. It's one that clearly is affecting the students that I'm teaching in my classes and uh, the people that I love and care about in my South Side Chicago neighborhood. So I want to echo the appreciation to the provost and the planning committee, especially to Professor Barbara Ransby for the work that went in and pulling this together. Um, and indeed, I've been asked to make a few comments about about kind of what's going on, or at least how I understand how we got to this point about race, policing, and violence. I'm going to do so by making briefly three basic points. The first point is that despite how alarming it was, how troubling it was to be in community this summer, what a terrible summer it felt like, so much violence um, in black and brown communities, so much concern over uh, police use of force. It's important to remember that these are not new problems. These are not new problems, uh, nor is the anti-black racism that surrounds both of those problems. Um, it's not new, and so we need to take a long view when we're looking at those problems. Community violence isn't new. The way that gender, race, and class frame that violence isn't new. Police violence isn't new. Anti-black racism isn't new, is it? These have been problems that have been around for a long time. In fact, activist and academic research has traced the root causes of these problems as far back as the brutality of the transatlantic slave trade to Jim Crow segregation, black codes, um, to the attacks on uh, black activists who were mobilizing in the 1960s, uprising in the 1970s, to the war on poverty, to advances made through affirmative action and job bills, to the kind of particular pressure that um, and constraints put on black families. Uh, black feminist scholars have looked at that and it's linked to violence. To the era of mass incarceration, um, mass incarceration in the 1990s when we began to pay attention to prisons as sites of violence and even to our current times and I think it's interesting that the next two sessions like this looking at the election and looking at immigration indeed we're hearing lots of violence in discussions about those two things. So what we need to understand is that while the violence isn't new there is something new about the way it's appearing. I'm arguing in my thinking about this that while the violence isn't new, what's new is that there are no programs anymore to prevent violence, very few. There are no organizations or initiatives that are set out to 
effectively respond to it. And instead, we have a series of misguided um, initiatives that blame the problem of violence on the people who experience it in sort of a neoliberal way, and that there's no longer public will to look deeply into the root causes of the violence. So while there has been, and we witnessed this summer, a kind of rhetorical concern about the violence uh, that we have witnessed and experienced, many of us, um, in part, we've had to pay attention to it because it's been so visible. There has not been any systemic plan to respond to what would really address the harm that the violence has caused. The community violence that we're seeing today is not new. The result of, it's a result of a series of long-standing public policy decisions to ignore the violence, to treat it superficially, and in some cases, I would argue recently, to actually fuel that violence. So my second point is that the root causes of the violence have been ignored historically and are treated superficially despite high profile and sensational views about the violence, but that today, this is my second point, today that violence is criminalized in a particular way. Not just the violence, but the root causes that lead to it. So most analyses of root causes include things like joblessness, persistent and profound poverty, lack of educational opportunities, uh, frustration uh, at the community level that emerges from ongoing racial, gender, class, oppression, destruction of families that result from things like mass incarceration, fear, isolation, those kinds of things, internalized oppression. Um, there's lots of good social science, public health, and uh, criminology literature that establishes a clear link between those root causes um, and violence at the micro and community level. These conditions are highly concentrated, of course, in black communities. Why? Because of the public policy decisions around allocation of resources. But what the research and therefore the programs that emerge from that research don't talk about, miss so significantly, is the public policy of criminalization that also has to be understood as a problem of violence. The public policy of criminalization that has to also be understood as a cause of the violence. So instead of reducing the harm by looking at the root causes that create violence, we arrest, we over-police, we monitor, and we incarcerate people in a way that furthers the violence. So Now that might sound paradoxical at first, but I think it's important, as my second point, to think about the ways that criminalizing the root causes of the violence, poverty, poor educational outcome, persistent uh, homelessness, the way that we criminalize the root causes of the violence actually makes the violence worse. So when I'm using the term criminal criminalization here, I'm talking about the way that we change social problems into crimes. So we have a high school dropout problem in urban cities uh, around the country, including Chicago. Um, and we know that high school dropout rates are linked to rates of violence in certain communities. We understand that that link has been firmly established. But arresting students who are truant or being expelled from school, responding to the problem by arrest, ultimately criminalizes them and furthers the violence that they might experience. We have good research that says what we really need to do instead is develop a policy that reopens neighborhood schools or changes curriculum so students stay engaged in schools, etc. Other examples of criminalization include arresting people who have substance abuse problems instead of offering treatment. Locking people up who are homeless and living in parks instead of a building affordable housing or providing mental health treatment. Passing curfew or loitering ordinances that prohibit the use of public space by some groups at certain times. Forcing people into secure uh, shelter programs when they're involved even voluntarily in, in uh, sex work on the street. These are examples of criminalization, looking at the root causes, treating them as crimes instead of responding to them as social problems. This problem, this process of criminalization is operationalized by who? The police. They're the front lines of this uh, criminalization process. And I'm not just talking about individual police officers, but more the institution of policing. The institution that has the authority to enforce new, rigid, controlling urban policies that make people who have particular disadvantages, those root causes that I talked about, make people who have those particular disadvantages into criminals. And those same people, those people turned criminals, experience the worst form of community violence and they're also targeted by the police. Young, unemployed men. 
also women and girls. I know that from my research, and we know that not only around domestic and sexual violence, but also about police brutality. Sex workers are targeted. Queer and trans people are targeted. Substance abusers are targeted. Homeless people are targeted in this city. That's not the story that the media told us about the summer, is it? But, and there's very little discussion about that kind of criminalization, but instead, um, we've seen this overly sensationalized version of what's happening in Chicago neighborhoods. Um, stories about violence and guns and gangs narratives that justify harsh policing, uh, lead to more criminalization, uh, helps us really believe in the appropriateness of allocating more money toward law enforcement, fewer dollars, little, little attention toward services uh, that really could support people who are experiencing those root causes, creating more disadvantage, and the cycle continues over and over again. And so this is my third and last point. The vicious cycle that links violence and policing, in my work I call the buildup of a prison nation. It looks something like this. Poor and disadvantaged communities in Chicago, black communities, intentionally left without resources, we made decisions to move resources, intentionally left without resources or schools or jobs, affected by new laws and new policies that make them vulnerable to this aggressive policing that we're experiencing and witnessing. And when I say them, I'm including the women and children and trans people and older people, not just the young men that the media has focused on. And these people are, are arrested and incarcerated, and then upon release, what happens, they return to the same over-policed, disadvantaged communities where the root causes aren't addressed. Violence is left unchecked, except by um, the ways that policing tries to respond to it. Return to the same disadvantaged communities, no jobs, no place to live, uh, new laws, now they're loitering, uh, public, no public benefits, no student loans, and then they're charged for their uh, inability to get to court. They have to pay for their own ankle bracelets, privatized parole services. Basically people being um, chased, really chased by military police, protected, who are protected by law to enforce policies that lead people to continue to be in the wake of a police uh, institution without addressing the root causes. And we're paying for this, not only paying for the policing, but we're paying for uh, what happens to people who bring charges against the police because of the, the harm that over-policing has uh, caused for them. People over and over again um, in this cycle. Last summer, we saw the convergence of the root causes of violence going unchecked because of systemic and persistent institutionalized racism. Decisions that we made to um, no longer fund the kind of community programs that allowed people to live their lives. We saw public policy, what happens when public policy and laws criminalize those who are most disadvantaged. And we see what happens when aggressive policing is justified because the violence is created because of the lack of attention to root causes. We saw that over and over again. We've seen it at least 3,000 times already this year. And I hope that in our discussion as we move forward, we'll talk about what to do to untangle this problem of only addressing a superficial dimension of what the violence is and really look at the root causes. I hope in our discussion we'll talk about things like prison abolition, reconsideration of policing, not just reform, but really reconsideration. Um, what we can do on this campus to talk about justice reinvestment, for example, so that disadvantaged communities have an opportunity to solve ourselves those root causes that ultimately lead us in the wake and the danger of the link between violence, policing, and race. Thank you. There are seats up front, folks who are standing in the, in the doorway and in the outer room there, please join us. Hello everyone. It's great to see such a great audience and such a wide range of people. My comments will be very much in line with those that Beth has presented. As Barbara indicated, the first two speakers were going to lay out something about the nature of the problem and where it stems. So essentially what I want to do is give a kind of political economic framework for what has been happening and why, and in that context then set the framework to talk about then these issues of police, violence, and community. <clears throat> 
I'm going to need some water. They, if we can, if we can. All right, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we didn't get we didn't we didn't get water for the speakers. Sorry. Over the last 40 years, changes have been incur occurring that are as significant as the Industrial Revolution. So the first thing that we need to understand is that for 40 years, the economic changes, the economic restructuring that has been taking place has had impacts. Some of this restructuring has occurred as a result of shifts in technology. We reached this age of the information age where our product was information itself, where the process itself was changed. And so the nature of production changed, the nature of how we consumed changed, the nature of how we managed our organizations has changed. There's a fundamental shift that has gone on in the economy over the last 40 years. We first saw it rear its ugly head here in Chicago and South Central LA, Buffalo, Detroit, many parts of the country with the dynamics of deindustrialization. And we know that the impacts of deindustrialization were to leave hundreds of thousands of people out of work. And in the course of that decline of manufacturing, it also left the devastation of communities, of neighborhoods. So what we saw is people who had been employed in livable wages then be without those jobs, without that ability to, to pay their, their expenses, let alone send their kids to college, was all affected by the shifts in the availability of jobs and the shifts in the economy itself. That was paralleled by the rise of service sector jobs, which is the point we also saw the rise of, of immigra immigrant, the increased immigration that filled some of the, the uh, low, low service or relatively unskilled service sector positions. Point is, we saw an entire restructuring of the economy. Right? And along with that, what that meant is three things. One is there was an effort to extract more profit from the production process itself. So that meant an attack on unions, it meant the rise of part-time labor, it, went the it meant the rise of informal labor, it meant uh, the, f the things like uh, um, p being paid by, by cards instead of in wages, almost a kind of strict sp script payment. So that the shift in the way in which pro way, um, the economy itself affected, right, the labor in that economy shifted, right? A second thing that happened, we started to see a shift in the role of the state and then the function of the state. So uh, Dr. Ritchie, for example, made reference to the fact that we don't have as many programs as we used to to deal with the violence, to intercept it, to, to prevent it, right? Uh, we, and I'm sure that Amy's going to address the issue of, of, of around mental health, right, and the issues that we don't have enough funding for mental health. Why? Right? Because of the decline and the, and the decline and the commitment on the part of the role of the state, right, in providing some of these basic services. So while there was this need to extract more profit on one hand, there was at the same time this pressure to reduce <coughs> meeting social demands and social needs, all in the name of, of, of the fact that we didn't have the money. But why didn't we have that money, right? Yes, we had increased social demands, but we had this additional pressure, right, on the economic system. The third thing that we started to see is we start seeing a shift in the internationalization of economic activities. So in this search to find markets, to expand markets, to, to be able to, um, to look for ways for moving money for around the world, right, that we also saw a shift in those kinds of activities. So all of these things interrelated meant that, we, that jobs left places like Chicago, they went to places like the U.S.-Mexico border where maquiladores were set up, where Mexican women could, were exploited on the U.S.-Mexico border, working in horrendous conditions for extremely low pay. A former professor of urban planning, for example, uh, who's now retired, wrote a book called Global Decisions, Local Collisions, where he actually tracked 
companies who had been in Chicago and tracked their movement to the U.S.-Mexico border. So whether we talk about U.S.-Mexico border or whether we talk about jobs going to Indonesia or Vietnam, or whether we talk about the exporting um, of jobs to um, the uh, call center jobs and so on, this is part of this all internationalization of the economic activities. How this played out is very much a function of the technolo technology that was possible. Because at the same time that we're seeing lots of innovation and lots of exciting things that we're able to have because of these changes, we also saw, for example, more mechanization uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the place, right? We saw more um, centralization of information and more control presumably in the name of efficiency of information. So there's a, a lot that, oh, and also on the international scale, we saw a lot more um, with things like trade agreements, right, which, which uh, take away the ability of sovereign governments to be able to have control even over some of their land use decisions. So obviously I could talk about this um, for a very long time, 40 years of, of research, 40 years of paying attention to this. But I think the point that I wanted, where I want to take, first of all, I want to lay this out as context, because we need to understand that this is part of what's been going on. And when we look at the role of the state, we're told that we should be against the government, that the government is the, is the problem for all of this. And what we've done is we've changed the role of the government to not be a source of, of support and a, a, support, a source to provide so, meet social demands and basic infrastructure needs, but instead to be the place, uh, and also the place not to do regulation, but instead it becomes the place, right, where uh, in fact we've seen more excessive control, social mechanisms of control have increased, and the technology has made some of these things even, even more, uh, more uh, important for us to look at. So what has this meant then, right? This has meant devastation of our communities in many of our communities. This has meant the disinvestment that we see on the southwest sides in Chicago, south, south and west sides of Chicago, are a function of these dynamics. When we lost all these industrial jobs, when we lost all these manufacturing jobs, we did not prepare for it. We did not think about how were we going to put those people who were out of work back to work. Right, so 40 years later, we're dealing with a problem that was created by, the very con by, by these very conditions, and we did nothing really to prepare for it. And now we have a whole new economy that people really aren't, aren't, aren't now prepared for. So at the same time that, we, that we've created these conditions where, we've, where neighborhoods now have become disinvested, we now have conditions where people don't have mechanisms, don't have ways to earn money in many instances. Uh, Barbara alluded uh, to, the, to the report that Great Cities did on uh, youth joblessness, joblessness among young people, and we know that the numbers are, are horrible. Almost half of African American men between the ages of 20 and 24, for example, are neither in work nor in school. I mean, how do you have a community with those kinds of numbers? And especially when you go to some of these communities, the numbers are even worse, and they're upwards of 70, 75, almost 80% in some cases. So those are the kinds of conditions that we're talking about. So now what happens then, and that has ramifications, because along with that, we've seen increased infiltration and penetration of these neighborhoods with drugs, um, and, and all this, and, and with those things have come a lot of other difficult, social conditions, right, for folks. Now then, what happens, right? We see a lot of things that, I'm sure the police force see a lot of things, right, that they never wish that they had to see. There's a lot of conditions in there, but what do we do? Do we blame people who are the who are most experiencing the negative impacts of these conditions, are they, are they the ones we blame for their own situation, right? Or do we understand this in the, in the structural context under which it's occurring? Which isn't to say that agency doesn't matter or individual choice doesn't matter. But we cannot say that this is simply a function of grit, for example, right? Or this is a function of simply of an individual choice, right? If the choices are so limited and if the range of possibilities are so limited, right? And so part of this is also what are the kinds of structural opportunities that exist? So now what happens to a police officer when he enters these kinds of situations? What happens to, what happens to any of us as we observe these situations? The point is not to blame not to say, well, uh, it's, it's their own fault. We, not to, again, not to take away from their agency, but it's the attitude with which we approach, which with which we approach people who are the most vulnerable in our society. A New York City police officer, for example, said, we get rewarded 
we get we get credits for basically arresting the most vulnerable in our society in our community so instead of seeing our most vulnerable as those that we should criminalize or as Troy Duster has told us in his book on the legislation of morality who become defined as immoral on the basis of laws that can change from one day to the next right that we define people as criminals we define them as immoral and on that basis then we approach what are essentially social social problems and so what I don't think is that it's it, it is important that we that police first of all have to be part of this solution and what we and it's a difficult situation then when we say well their job is not to be social worker or their job is not to 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 look at the, the full conditions here but their job instead is to um, um, is just to arrest. And I think part of what we have to do then is reimagine what is the role of the police. Because what we don't need the police just to be are mechanisms of social control. Right? We don't need them, and I don't think they want to be necessary, the majority of them, just the forces of social control. But in fact, how can we reimagine our police force to be part of the solution in rebuilding neighborhoods? Because none of this is going to go away until we put our work into rebuilding the neighborhoods, bringing capital back into those neighborhoods, bringing schools back into those neighborhoods, and bringing opportunities back into those neighborhoods. So with that, I'm, I hope we'll have not only more discussion today, but in two weeks. Thank you, and thank you, Provost. Good afternoon. So my work is focused on sort of a narrow slice of the issue, specifically on police response to persons with mental illness or people experiencing mental health crisis. And we don't have great data on just how much time they spend doing this, but the estimates are around 10% of police encounters involve someone who has a mental illness. So it's a significant part of their time, and they're pretty involved in this process and responding to people in the community. We also don't have great data on the number of police-involved shooting deaths across the country or how many of those involve people in mental health crisis. Um, there's been a few organizations that have looked into this and basically their estimates suggest that people with mental illness are at significantly elevated risk as well. We know that in Chicago and across the country, some of the recent tragedies have involved people experiencing mental health crisis, more specifically young black men in crisis. The good news is that we do have some models to improve how police respond. Um, the one that I've spent a lot of time looking at is the crisis intervention team model, and I've looked at Chicago's program, and I've looked at programs across the country um, that are using the CIT model. And what it is, it's a model that was developed in Memphis, Tennessee, after a police-involved shooting of an African-American man with schizophrenia. And after that, a number of stakeholders came together, so different service provider agencies, the police department, as well as advocacy groups and consumer groups came together to really talk about what they wanted police to do and how they could work together to build that. And they created a program that involves a, sort of one of the best known elements of it is a 40 hour training for police officers. And the idea is that it's officers that volunteer to go through the training and then to be dispatched to calls involving mental health crisis. So you hear a lot of talk about all officers should get this training. And certainly all officers need some training in responding, but here the idea is that you get the officers that actually want to take on this role. And they may actually be better suited for doing that. There's also other important pieces of the model. Um, there's changes in organizational culture and policy that value being effectively responding to these situations. Because police officers, I mean, they get a pat on the back for confiscating drugs, making arrests, getting guns. Um, but they don't get much in terms of a pat on the back for responding effectively and safely to someone in crisis. So kind of shifting that. And then the other piece is really the big part is that collaboration with sort of all stakeholders in the community to develop the program, but then also ongoing problem solving. And we do have some evidence that this model can increase linkages to mental health services for people who come in contact with police. Also that it can reduce force in these encounters so we can have encounters handled more safely and also that it can reduce arrests so that we have fewer people that are actually getting sort of sucked into the criminal justice system. Um, because once someone with a mental illness comes in contact and, and penetrates the criminal justice system, they, spend to tend, they tend to spend more time than someone without a mental illness. It's a little bit harder to get out. 
So we know that CIT programs and other models that are related to it can be really promising in terms of improving how police respond to mental health crisis. And recently the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing report actually highlighted CIT. Um, they sort of missed that CIT is not just a training intervention, that it involves other components that I think are really important, um, but it really was highlighted. And so I've been doing work for a while. I start to realize how old I am when I realize how long I've been working in this. Um, but I started noticing a few things about CIT and the programs that I've looked at that suggest that the benefits of CIT and similar programs may not be evenly realized across communities. Um, and like many things, the disparities tend to break down along the lines of race and economic disadvantage. Um, so one of the first things that I've really become aware of recently is that in our CIT training, which we have evidence that it is pretty good training, um, we are able to improve officer skills, um, but a lot of the training um, involves case studies, scenarios, and role-playing exercises that police officers go through so they can learn to recognize mental illness and they can practice their skills. But of the curriculums that I've looked at, I've started to notice that many of these examples um, focus, basically they, they um, feature white people in mental health crisis, okay? And I found a few that look at responding to a veteran in crisis that used a Latino man as, as the subject, but in general we don't do a very good job sort of um, providing some diversity and, and teaching officers and, and giving them examples uh, of people from different race and ethnic backgrounds. And this could re really reinforce that implicit bias, that if someone is struggling, maybe um, their behavior is coming to the attention of the police, that if they're white, it might be a mental health crisis and we might want to respond with a CIT approach. But if they're not white, then perhaps this is criminal and, and something else is going on and we do more of a tactical approach. Um, and you know, my daughter actually sent me Jesse Williams' speech at the BET Awards that really kind of captures this, is that police do a pretty, we're getting pretty good at de-escalating white guys, um, but we're not doing as well for other people. And that's something that we really need to start to look at and work extra hard that as we're, we're using these models and we're providing this training that we're not actually reinforcing implicit bias. Um, Implicit bias is really hard to change, but our first step really needs to be not reinforcing it in our training. And I also think that this bias starts, it's not just when the police get there, it could start at the level of when a 911 call comes in. So somebody get, they get a call, depending on where it's coming from, who's calling, who the person is that's being called on, um, assumptions could be made that influence how this call is labeled and what information the police get when they get there, and that could play out all the way through the criminal justice and mental health system. So I think it's something we need to become more aware of and really work hard not to reinforce. The other th issue, so I think that's a big one and I hope to more systematically look at it um, in the near future, but the other thing that's become really clear to me as we go and talk to officers, we talk to people with mental illness that have had contact with the police and we talk to providers, is that while the training you know, is pretty good and if we make it better, that's great, but we can't train our way out of this problem. Um, at least not by itself. Um, we can't fix the fact that many areas of the city have very few mental health services. And we know that services in Chicago and other large cities are not evenly distributed. The south and west side of Chicago are pretty sparse in terms of mental health services and that actually got worse when the city closed six of the, the city mental health clinics around the same time that the Community Mental Health Council also closed. Um, so in those areas, that impacts what police officers are asked to respond to, kind of at what point they're called, if people have other options to, to turn to first. And it also impacts kind of what resources they have to offer when they respond. Um, at this point, actually, is most of the city, the, the main resources they have is the emergency room or taking someone to jail. And both of those generally aren't that helpful in most situations. Most people need something beyond just an emergency room visit, something more of a community mental health type of service. Um, and jail is certainly not appropriate for most people that the police come in contact with who are symptomatic. Um, so I think, I mean, it's very important and, you know, as everybody's talked about, we, we can talk about police. This is not just a police problem. This is a much bigger problem. And I think while we need to scrutinize how police respond, we also need to scrutinize the systems and the structures that have really failed um, many communities in Chicago. Thank you.
Good afternoon. And um, thank you to the provost and her committee for planning this important conversation. And I look forward to the follow-up in two weeks. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, restorative justice and the impact on communities. And I know that we've heard from the previous panel list quite a bit about um, the harm that is done to communities. And so I'm going to ask you if you would indulge me and just close your eyes for a moment. Because I want to start with um, the words of Langston Hughes and uh, his poem, Harlem. And when I think about harm to communities, this poem often speaks to me, and I hope that it does the same to you. And after I finish reading the poem, I'm going to ask you to just um, keep your eyes closed for a few more moments while I ask a couple of questions. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? And with your eyes still closed, I think about that initial question that we were asked in this panel, what is going on and why? And I want you to think about the ways that dreams have been deferred in many of the communities that we're talking about today. And what happens when there's disinvestment? And what happens when there's trauma? And what happens when there's consistent poverty? And what happens when there's a lack of education, a lack of employment, lack of housing, lack of health care, lack of justice? You may open your eyes. So when we talk about the events and what has happened, I think we have to think beyond just the fact that there's been an expression of anger. Um, Sometimes people think of protest as only an expression of anger, but really we are talking about that there's a deep-seated need for change. People want to see something done differently. They want their communities to be whole, they want their families to be whole, and they want to be whole themselves. And so um, when I think about harm that's been done to communities and when I think about restorative justice and what that means then we have to think about the fact that when you have healthy communities then healthy communities have healthy institutions and healthy communities also have healthy relationships with the institutions in their communities. And so when we see that those relationships or those, the relationship with those institutions are off kilter or they are sick then we have to look at the totality of the circumstances and understand what is it that's going to help to repair that harm, what is it that's going to help make that community whole or make it well, and if what we've been doing hasn't worked, then why do we keep doing it? Right now, as you know, we focus on a punitive system of justice where um, if a crime has been committed, and we look at ways to punish the offender. We look at ways to find a way to hold someone responsible through punishment. But when we think about, um, and it's really in a lot of ways based in fear, right? And so when we think about healthy and whole communities, then we're not typically thinking about communities that are operating from a place of fear. We're thinking of communities that can operate from a place of healthy whole relationships. And that's what restorative justice is really about. How do you um, repair the harm that might take place because of an act of violence? Repair the harm that might take place because of a crime? How do you not just look at how do we punish one particular person, but rather how do we look at the needs of everyone that's involved? So we look at the victim. 
What does the victim need when a crime has happened, when an act of violence has happened? Um, we look at the person that might have committed the offense. And what does that person need? What, what led to the fact that this person has gotten to the point of committing this offense? And then what is often left out of the equation is what does the community need? What does the community need to repair the harm? So I thought I could talk about just a couple of examples in the couple of minutes that I have about how restorative justice has been utilized. And then hopefully um, there can be additional conversation in the next couple of weeks. So um, restorative justice, again, focuses on the harm that's been done and what do we need to do to repair the harm. And it's really based in building positive relationships. And how can you bring people together to have a positive dialogue to build the kinds of relationships when you can really be concerned about meeting one another's needs? So there is, some of you may be aware of, a new restorative justice community court that is being developed in North Lawndale, a community on the west side of Chicago. They got a grant from the Center for Court Innovation. And the idea is that um, and one of the real tenets of re restorative justice is that there's, the wisdom is in the room. That we don't have to go external to our community to determine what's best for our community. So when an act of violence or a crime has been committed, how can we look at the people and the resources that are in our very own communities to decide what the solution should be to that act or that, um, of, or that crime? So in North Lawndale, this community court is being developed in partnership with system stakeholders. It's a court that's being developed with the uh, Circuit Court of Cook County, but also with community residents. And I always think about who knows communities best. The people who live there, the people who grew up there, the people who raised their families there. They are the people who know their community best and they are joining forces with a system that often doesn't have a connection to the community. They see the community, they see people from the community come through their courtrooms, but they don't necessarily know the community. This court is focused on 18 to 26 year olds, which we know have some of the highest rates of arrest and detention. And they are focusing on those that are charged with nonviolent felonies as well as misdemeanors. And what happens is the individual after arrest will see the judge, they will make a determination of, as to whether this person would be appropriate for the community court, and then they go to the community. And instead of looking at it from a punitive standpoint, again they are looking at the community being responsible taking responsibility, and I know that Dr. Cordova talked a little bit about reimagining the roles of these various system stakeholders. Well, how about thinking about how we reimagine the role of the community when we think about justice and our pursuit of justice? So the community then um, goes, might have a peace circle or some other forum where they have some dialogue. This can include the victim, where the victim can speak for him or herself and decide what would make me whole and can convey that. <clears throat> and then we also have the person who committed the offense who's a part of this process. And the community can look at what led this person to commit this offense and what does that person need? Is it uh, reconnecting with education? Is it a job? Is it mental health or drug treatment services? What is needed to make the victim whole and the person who committed the offense? And then what is the community looking for as a whole? And so then the judge would monitor whatever the community decides is best, and then the state's attorney can either defer the case, dismiss the charges, um, or if there's some sort of plea, then they will work out how to, hopefully try to work out how to vacate um, so that the record can be cleared of any kind of felony charge, and that person can then continue to be a productive member of, this, of the community. So, this type of approach, moving from punitive justice to restorative justice, really requires a high degree of trust. And what we know we, is that we have a system, we have communities that have a high level of distrust of systems. And so it's going to take time, and it's going to take bringing people together to really talk with one another and understand each other and understand the pain that is often underneath some of the actions that we see coming about.
The second thing that's really important besides trust is accountability and how we make sure that whereas in one system, in a punitive system, you might have someone who says, okay, well, I spent this amount of time in prison and that's it versus what is really required to say you are responsible, we are responsible as a community for helping make sure that each other is whole. So that's the kind of accountability that we need. But when I think about some of the other things that were recently mentioned, all of the panelists talked about the lack of resources in our communities. If we're going to look to communities to be able to meet the needs, then we have to make sure that there's an investment in communities. It's hard to say, well, this person needs this type of service or this person needs that, and then there's nothing in the community to be able to provide that. So it's really, as someone mentioned before, when we talk about reinvestment or justice reinvestment, it's thinking about, are we going to pour the funds into continuing to incarcerate, or how can we do some level of cost shifting and find other ways that we can invest in the community to keep people out of the system? And that's something that I hope that we can talk more about in the next couple of weeks. The last thing that I'll just mention is um, in, there will be a forum on this in October that our Center for Public Safety and Justice um, uh, just completed a four-month um, project called the Building Blocks Experiment where we brought together system stakeholders with people who have been through the system to have a tour of the communities. We went to West Garfield Park in North Lawndale. We had a meal together each of those four times and we sat in circle. And it reminded me as I saw people kind of start, and these are, we had police, we had people from the uh, Cook County Jail, we had um, state's attorneys, public defenders, and uh, elected officials, on not on one side, but in the room. And then on the other side, we had people who had been in the jail, who had been in the police lockups, who had been in all of these institutions, coming together to talk about can we build a relationship and what are our shared experiences. And what started where we were kind of all awkward and sitting on opposite sides of the room over the four months that we were together, just meeting once a month, by the end we were all coming together. Um, they were rearranging chairs saying this is more like a family. And so what can happen with our system when we think about building relationships, what will happen if we move from it's an us versus them to what are we going to do as members of a community and we're all members of a community somewhere. And so these are the kinds of things that we're exploring, um, but restorative justice when we talk about how do we repair the harm, the key is we have to really think about are we going to be honest about the harm that has been done and then allow people from the community to answer the question as what is needed to repair that harm. It's not a question that can be answered by anyone else. It has to come from those who have been harmed. So I look forward to talking with you about this in two weeks. Thank you for being able to share. One minute. One minute. I think it's for her. One week. I'm so sorry. I just said one OK, so it'll be sooner than we thought. One minute. So we're, we have very disciplined um, panelists, so we're right on time. I know people have other obligations. And, you know, we knew going into this, and we sort of said going into this, this is way too big uh, a set of issues. It's way too complex for us to really uh, have the kind of conversations we need and want to have. So we cannot do that today, and I feel, you know, badly that you've all sat there, and, and I... I'm curious as to what you're thinking. But what I would just say is please be a part of the ongoing conversation uh, September 21st, which is one week away, not two weeks That's away. Right. Two weeks away we may be having another conversation. <laughs> but but one week from now, and I think Rex Tolliver is going to tell me, uh, it's in this building at what time? 12? At noon. At noon in this building, there'll be plenty of signage. Um, we, uh, we invite you to come back for a more interactive uh, part of this. But just to say, you know, again, that our, our panelists have given us a lot to think about, you know, what, what does it mean to look at the criminalization um, of poor communities of color and how does that lead to the kind of um, violent contacts with police that we've seen? Um, what does it mean, as Teresa reminds us, when we look at ec economic restructuring um, in cities like Chicago and in, in my hometown of Detroit, when people are forced into an underground informal economy, which is very violent, and that again breeds a kind of um, encounters that, that we've seen. We haven't talked a lot about the protests and the activism that 
that has occurred uh, over the last two years since the, since the shooting of Mike Brown in, in Ferguson. But I urge you in our conversations on the 21st, let's take that up as well, because sometimes that's a messy, difficult, complicated part uh, of the conversation when we bring in, you know, what has protest done to our consciousness. But I think we have to be honest to say that those protesters, those angry young people, have also brought this issue uh, to forums like this in ways that we don't often acknowledge. So I hope that can be um, a part of our conversation as well. Again, thank you to the provost for bringing us together, and she's going to close us out uh, with an announcement or a remark. Okay. And thanks our panelists. Yes, thank you, Barbara, and thank you all the panelists. Um, that was just a marvelous and, and so full of important information and analysis, so thank you. Um, I just want to let you know this is being videotaped, and we're going to put the video up on the website on the um, uh, provost.uic.edu. So if you want to watch it again or if you want to tell your friends or if you want to use it in a class or assign it, whatever you want to do, it will be up there uh, shortly. So thank you again for coming. That's mine. Someone's glasses were up there too. Does someone have glasses? Those are not mine.